Very happy to be here, happy to be invited. Right, well, what I'm going to do is um, start by looking at what we think we know about drug-related crime. Now, firstly, when we talk about drug-related crime, we're talking about illicit drugs, and the reason we're talking about illicit drugs is because certain substances have been made legal through statute, often as a result of international obligations, and our main sort of drugs legislation are based in the 1977 Misuse of Drugs Act. Now, later on, hopefully in a bit of discussion, we can talk about some contemporary issues. One particular issue is the whole issue of so-called head shops and psychotropic substances and new substances. Every week, apparently, a new substance is being, is being created. And the challenges that creates for any legislative system or any system of criminal deterrence. Um, so we'll have a little chat about that. I want to start, however, by just talking a little bit about the background um, to, the, to the issue of, of, of drug-related crime. And then I'm going to talk about the official picture. And that is what people talk about, or what you read in the newspapers often about the, you know, where politicians say the crime rate is increasing or decreasing, etc. I'm going to sort of interrogate that a little bit and see what exactly that means. Um, and then I'm going to look at the, um, what we refer to as the dark figure, of drug-related crime, what that picture, that official picture, doesn't tell us. And then I'm going to go through the various models that look at, that have, that have emerged to try and explain the connection between illicit drug use and offending behaviour. And there are four sort of dominant models that have emerged in the literature to, to explain the connection. And because people sort of assume that it's quite simple, but it's, it's actually a very complex area in terms of determining the causative connection between the use of illicit drugs and offending behaviour. Most people who use illicit drugs don't commit any offence whatsoever, except the offence of possession. Um, and that's something that, uh, that we, we can touch on as well. I'm then going to go into a little bit, you know, in, in a more sort of topical way, looking at how we understand the drugs phenomenon in, an, in, the, in a Dublin context in particular. Um, the way in which different sort of perspectives within society have responded to the, to the problem, the way in which the state has responded, the way in which communities most affected by the problems have responded, and then maybe we'll start talking about other different approaches that are debated, legalisation, decriminalisation, uh, and various other models that have emerged, perhaps in Portugal or in, or in the Netherlands, etc. So um, hopefully, you know, be as interactive as you want. Feel free to, um, you know, to cut across, and at the end... Hopefully we'll have time for a bit, of a, a, bit of a bit of a discussion. Now the photographs I'm using here, and I'm trying not to be overly academic here, so I've, I've used photographs that, that have been taken by a, a friend of mine called Ronnie Close. And myself and Ronnie worked on a project in the mid-1990s um, where we were looking at the whole revival of the anti-drugs movement as it emerged at that time. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with this, um, the, the drug phenomenon, particularly heroin, really impacted in the north inner city in the late, uh, in the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, at that time, a movement emerged made up of uh, what was referred to as the concerned parents against drugs because there was a perception that the state and that the police uh, either couldn't or wouldn't respond adequately uh, to the problem. This phenomenon emerged again in the mid-1990s, particularly with the emergence of ecstasy and the whole rave scene, and then the re resurgence, in a way, of heroin back onto the, back onto the scene, and a number of drug-related deaths, particularly uh, in inner-city Dublin communities and in, and in, in sort of um, economically deprived parts of the, of the area of, of Dublin as a whole. Um, and then we had a sort of a, a, sort of a quite, what you might refer to as a watershed uh, and that was the, um, the murder of Veronica Geeran, a journalist in 1996 by people uh, allegedly connected to the trade uh, in, in drugs. And that led to a major reaction from the state in terms of, uh, of legislation and, uh, and that sort of approach has really been sustained over time. It led to a sort of a renewal of the whole sort of what has been referred to as the, as the war uh, on drugs at that time. It was a major challenge to the democratic institutions of the state uh, that a journalist uh, was murdered who had been prominent in writing about uh, people involved in drug-related crime and gangland uh, uh, and those involved in gangs, etc., associated with drugs. Um, and this was a major, you know, 
what was perceived as a major symbolic threat uh, to the state, and so it, it was quite an important uh, watershed. So we'll talk a little bit all of that. Now, I'm going to go through, um, and then I'll ta- we'll talk a little bit about the challenge in recent times as a result of, of head shops and also the internet, and what that has, the challenge that has created for people trying to legislate against these uh, against psychoactive substances which are changing so rapidly and which are, can be sold so easily over the internet, etc. Now, I'm going to show a couple of graphs and I hope you can see them easily enough. And this reflects what I refer to as the official picture. Now, when you read the newspapers or you hear at, coming up to election time in particular where one group of politicians are saying that this group are soft on crime and this group, the other group is saying that we're hard on crime and we're tough on crime... And then one group will come back and say, but drug, drug crimes are increasing, our uh, crimes associated with drugs are increasing dramatically. Now, what we're actually talking about in that debate is very little in terms of what actually is happening, but what the statistics, the official picture is telling us is really what the police are doing. And they are a reflection of law enforcement activity. And, and so, for example, the statistics that we see are produced largely by, by customs and by the Garda Síochána, who have the main responsibility in the state for the prosecution uh, of, of drug offences. But those statistics are determined by, by the resources of, the, of, of these agencies, by their ability to detect drugs, by the ability of those involved in the trade to conceal, uh, conceal their drugs and to evade uh, uh, detection. So really what these figures are telling us is about what the police do in response, in carrying out their mandate to enforce drug offences, the offences contained in the Misuse of Drugs Act. And the main offences that are prosecuted are possession, uh, what are, are what we refer to as simple possession, it's a Section 3 offence, possession for, uh, you know, often for personal use, uh, amounts of, uh, of a substance, mostly cannabis, and then uh, drug supply, Section 15, where you're, you are prosecuted for uh, the possession and distribution uh, of drugs. And then you have a couple of other offences that, that sort of are, are, are dominant, such as obstruction, where you might try and throw, throw drugs around, down a toilet, or, or you might try and resist arrest, and this is another dominant uh, area. Cultivation of drugs, um, personal cultivation is an area that has increasingly been, uh, it's, it's increasingly dominating headlines that we're hearing about factories uh, where people are, are producing their own drugs. Now again, is this a real increase in this phenomenon, or are we just seeing law enforcement focusing more on it? And this is a very difficult one uh, to know. Now, what you see here, if you follow the, uh, the, the, the yellow line, that's the total drug offences between 1993 and 2005. The, the pink line is for possession, and the blue line is for su- supply. So what that tells us immediately is that the main trend in drug offences is determined by possession offences. That is the bulk of, of the offences that are prosecuted uh, uh, through the courts. If you notice something interesting there as well, in 1997, you see that the line jumps up very rapidly. Now, I think that that is because of the murder of Veronica Guerin in 1996. And what you saw was this major reaction by the state. But in terms of statistics, where you'd see politicians say we're winning the fight against, uh, against drugs, etc., what you see in actual practice is a huge increase in people being prosecuted for the simple possession of cannabis. Um, not really what y- you would see as, as a very significant response to that murder. Now, a huge number of other things happened as well, of course, which, we, which we'll talk about. But all, all I'm trying to sh- illustrate here is the way in which statistics can be so um, can be revealing, but also the way in which they can conceal uh, so much of what is actually uh, happening. Now, again, this shows you that most of the offences that are prosecuted are for cannabis, as the line sort of very clearly follows, uh, uh, follow, follows each other. The, the possession, um, uh, most of, of the possession offences are related to cannabis. So most of the prosecutions that we see in the, in the statistics are for people possessing cannabis for personal use. Now, I'm not offering any moral position on this. That is the law. The law must be enforced, um, but that is also what, uh, what, what is actually happening. And, of course, there is a huge debate as to the legal status of cannabis, and it is probably one of the, the most hotly contested issues within this whole area, both publicly and in terms of the literature, uh, etc. Here we look at 
prosecutions for heroin and prosecutions for cocaine between 95 and 2005 over that decade. And what is interesting, if you look at the pink line, which is cocaine, through the whole Celtic Tiger era, you saw cocaine moving beyond its sort of idea as the rich man's uh, 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 drug, contained within sort of a certain <coughs> sort of section of society. Um, and heroin was seen as a drug that was always associated with those really on the margins uh, of society, what we refer to as dependent or problematic users. But what you see is a steady increase in, the, in prosecutions of cocaine until it eventually eclipses heroin uh, for the first time in the history of the state in around 2004. Now, another thing that tells us is that this data can be useful. It can show us trends in what is actually going on, and it's an, it, it's an indirect indicator of availability. Um, you can compare, say, police data with treatment data, and that can help you build up a picture uh, of what actually is going on. This is one that I, that I think is very interesting, and this is um, under 17-year-olds prosecuted by gender from 95 to 2005. Now, if you look at that, you'll see that the number of females remains very low and relatively steady while the number of males increases year on year um, pretty much dramatically over, over the decade. Now, is that because more boys are using, um, or is it something else? And um, it doesn't reflect, say, use of alcohol by girls, because what we have seen in, in alcohol data is that the use of alcohol by girls is actually coming closer to the use over that period of time um, to the use of alcohol by males. And sometimes alcohol and illicit drug use can be sort of comparable uh, to a certain degree. There's another way that might be, there's another explanation. For example, when young people are stopped and searched, for a girl to be searched, there needs to be a female guard uh, present. But there is a lot less female guards than there are male guards. So possibly it could be that. If I was a teenager and I was walking down the street with, with drugs it would be the girl who'd be carrying them because she'd be less likely uh, to, be, uh, to be stopped, to be searched, to be detected. And what that tells us is the way in which statistics are a production of the discretionary behaviour of law enforcement. The way in which often the picture that we think we have is a picture that has been constructed by the day-to-day the day, the day -day activities of, uh, of, law, of law enforcement because I don't think that picture really reflects uh, what is going on uh, out there. And you could also argue um, uh, uh, from a perspective of young males that that is discriminatory police behaviour. And this young male, I think, would probably <laughs> agree with you. Um, now, if we look at drug offences more recently, again, we have seen a consistent increase. That's a bit difficult to read, but the, the, the broken line at the top is total drug offences. Second one is drug possession, and the third one is supply. And again, we can see that supply is relatively consistent. Possession, uh, the total is really, the trend in the total number is really determined by possession, uh, by uh, simple possession. If we look more recently as well, what we can see is, and this is an interesting phenomenon in recent times, we have seen a decline as the, as the Celtic tiger and people's disposable income has declined, we have seen a simultaneous decline in the use uh, of, uh, of illicit substances, or at least in their detection. Um, now, I wouldn't say that that reflects any difference in police behaviour. I'd say it actually is probably an, a more accurate reflection of people's uh, actual use uh, of illicit substances, because other surveys, other studies have, have also reflected this decline. Again, if we look here, we can see um, the dark broken line is ecstasy. And that's an interesting phenomenon because where in the mid-1990s you had a huge seizures of ecstasy and it was a very popular drug, what this tells us is that it was a culturally relevant drug. It emerged at a particular time, probably associated with the rave culture. It was popular at a certain time. But something else might be happening there as well, and that is the growth, the emergence of head shops and the use of other substances that might have mirrored ecstasy or mirrored cocaine for example, methadrone, which increasingly became popular and possibly displaced the use uh, of ecstasy. And what we've all, the sort of the other line there, the sort of smaller dots on it, that's cocaine. And that's an interesting, uh, where, where you see this rapid decrease in cocaine. And again, I would say that reflects 
the 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 the, um, the lesser availability of uh, disposable income for people um, and, and the lesser use of cocaine. Um, and then heroin at the bottom is relatively consistent because heroin is a drug because that, that often those who use it, who are dependent drug users, the economic circumstances don't really matter to them. It's, it's what we refer to in economic terms as an economically inelastic demand for that drug. Because um, if it becomes more expensive, people will rob more uh, to pay for it. And the economic circumstances don't really matter because there's a, there's a serious dependency or a serious addiction. So it doesn't, as easily as other drugs such as cocaine, it doesn't necessarily reflect people's disposable uh, income. But what are we missing? <clears throat> Firstly... In general, when we talk, talk about crime and, and, and the law that is there, politicians, when they respond to crime, they will, they, maybe they'll, they'll pass some legislation. Now, that's fine, but we know very little about how that legislation is actually enforced. We know next to nothing about how that legislation <coughs> is actually uh, enforced. Um, we also know very little in this country. In the UK, for example, we know that about one out of the four crimes that are committed upon people are actually reported to the police. Now the reason we know that is because what they do, they've been doing it since the 1980s, they've been comparing the official picture from the police data with self-report studies that are conducted every year. So they, they look at the official picture and they ask people, were you a victim of crime in the last year? And they say, yes, they will, did you report it? No, we didn't. Why didn't you? Well, there was no point, nothing would happen, there was no insurance potential, there was, um, I couldn't be bothered, the police wouldn't do anything, nothing would happen. So actually in terms of the crime picture, what we are seeing is only a very small part uh, of, of the picture of crime. If we go into certain types of crime, for example shoplifting, only one out of 11 shoplifting offences are actually reported. If we look at bicycle thefts, it's even, it's even higher. So in terms of our picture of crime, in terms of the official picture, it is extremely limited in terms of reflecting what is actually happening. Um, and even when people do report crimes, that doesn't mean they're actually ever recorded. For example, a study in the UK showed that 40% of crimes reported to the police weren't recorded. Perhaps the police officer at the time didn't think it was a crime, didn't believe it was important enough, maybe they were finishing their shift and they couldn't bother. And all of these things have been shown as reasons why uh, uh, this might be the case. And again, human behaviour is an important element of this and discretionary uh, behaviour in terms of how our picture of crime is affected. But the dark figure of crime, that's what we call this, um, is much higher for drug-related uh, crime um, because a lot of drug-related crime is, never enters the official picture. A lot of drug-related offences, like serious ones, are never reported. And one of the main reasons for this is because people are fearful of those involved in the drug trade. Um, other times, people don't care. If they see somebody smoking a joint or they see some a crime is, is being committed, but it's their business. It's not really that important. And there are much more serious crimes. And we know in this country, of course, that the really serious crimes um, aren't, aren't often seen as crimes. For example, tax evasion. I remember having a conversation with a businessman one time and it took me about an hour to explain that tax evasion was actually a crime. And, there, and that was a culture that we are beginning to see the consequences of now. That only certain crimes on the criminal statute books have ever been enforced. And so crime is also, and who we see as offenders, is also a production of how society determines what's important to prosecute and what's not uh, important. Um, most of what we know in terms of crime, or as we see crime, it relates to street-level uh, crime. Theft, burglary, robbery, assault, etc. That is the sort of the bread and butter of what we would determine as crime. And those we would see as criminals are often referred to as, rather referred to as, as police property groups, the people that the police prosecute on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, usually young working-class males make up the bulk of the, of the offender. And if you look at, the, say, those in prison, for example, the vast majority of those in Mountjoy prison come from three postal districts uh, in Dublin. And that is also re a reflection of the discretionary nature of the system. 
Certain people are, certain people are stopped. Certain people are arrested. Um, and certain people, the way they talk back to the guards, might determine whether they will be actually prosecuted or not, or where they are from. Um, the whole attitude test, do they pass the attitude test? Certain people for the same offence might be likely to, to get a custodial sentence, while others would not. And that is the whole discretionary nature of the criminal justice system, and that makes up our picture. Now, there are four dominant models explaining the link between drug use and crime. The first is, is what we refer to as the psychopharmacological model, which says that there is something within the property of the substance that leads to the offending behaviour. Um, intoxication, where it might cause criminal, especially violent behaviour. Now, research has shown a very strong connection between offending behaviour and the consumption of alcohol. It, and there's a consistent association between violent crime uh, and alcohol, and I don't think that would be huge news for most of us here. But the link between offending behaviour and particularly violent crime has been refuted with regards to heroin and, and cannabis. There is some evidence uh, for crack cocaine. There is some evidence for heroin, particularly where people are interfered with. If they have heroin in their possession or, or if they are shooting up, there can be a violent uh, reaction. But really the link, the violent link, has not been pr uh, proven. It is seen the social environment, the context in which drugs are used, is a much more important indicator of violence than the actual psychopharmacological effect of the substance themselves. The second important link is what we refer to as the economic compulsive or the acquisitive. And this would be the one that would be most dominant probably in most of our minds, where people are committing crimes to feed their habit. This has been proven in terms of research, international and Irish research, that we have seen an increase in e economically motivated crimes after addiction, after people become dependent on drugs, and when they are in an effective uh, well-resourced treatment program, for example methadone maintenance with other supports, we have seen a reduction in offending behaviour. So again that proves from the other side, from the treatment side, a clear connection between uh, economically motivated crimes and, and addiction. I'm going to show you a couple of police studies that were done here which I think uh, are interesting. What they show and what a lot of other data shows is that an increase in, in employment and the availability of treatment has seen a very large reduction in economically motivated crimes here in Ireland. Another important point, however, is that those who are dependent on drugs are far more likely to be caught offending than those who are not dependent on drugs. The police know who they are because they're, they're, they're essentially they're, they're bread and butter. They're picking them up every day or they're stopping them every day. So somebody who is, let's say, a chaotic drug user or a dependent, problematic user is much more likely to be stopped and prosecuted than somebody who is not dependent. For example, somebody who uses drugs at the weekend, a recreational user who goes to work on a Monday morning. They do not appear in the st statistics. They're not generally stopped, they're not prosecuted, etc. Um, and their, their use of the substance is manageable. They are, they are managing it. And they're not engaging in, in serious crime, um, in, in any crime, beyond possession, um, uh, so they don't appear, uh, really. Just very quickly, two studies were done, one that got a huge lot of attention in 1997. Um, it was a Garda study, and they asked a number of people who they knew were uh, dependent drug users a series of questions. And then a, a sort of follow-up study, not as strong a study, was done in 2004, again, by the Garda Research Unit. And just to go through a couple of the, the, the findings. Those who found that crime as their main source of income. In 97, it was 59%. In 2004, it was 13%. Now, at that time, in 2004, there was a huge increase in employment. There was an almost levelling out of unemployment. Unemployment was effectively gone at that time. And that, what, what that tells us is that people who are dependent on drugs can also maintain a job. So it, it, it sort of breaks the, that sort of stigma that we have, that people were actually maintaining employment at some, at, in some level and also uh, maintaining their, 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 their drug use. And it was serious drug use, heroin primarily. And again, the unemployment rate was far less in the, in the latter study than in 97. Um, the drug first used was cannabis, and that's been fairly consistent, although if we exclude tobacco and we exclude alcohol, um, uh, cannabis was the drug first used. First introduced drugs by a friend, and this again is consistent 
uh, is 81% and 86%. And that's very consistent with all studies I'm aware of, that people are first introduced to illicit drugs by somebody they know, by a family member or a friend. Now, why that's a very important point is that there is this perception of drug dealers as the stranger at the school gate, as it's put, preying on people. Actually, most people are introduced to drugs by somebody that they know and somebody that is close to them. And that must question our whole understanding of the drug dealing enterprise and how people actually become involved in drugs in, in the first place. Drug source from a local dealer had increased from 46% to 76%. And what that tells, tells me, anyway, is that drug markets are far more integrated into local communities. We must also remember that the mobile phone became very, uh, you, know, you know, everyone had mobile phones. And anyone with a mobile phone and a list of names can be a drug dealer. And they're very difficult to detect from a policing perspective. So an easier access to drugs was also facilitated by, uh, by, the, by the mobile phone. The number had been to, to prison had decreased uh, slightly and the estimated daily expenditure um, wasn't a, allowing for inflation, etc., wasn't that different. And an, an interesting finding was the movement from the punt to the euro. And um, obviously people aren't going to start looking for change on the street like, you know, it's 12.5 12 euro for 10 punts. And so it's, what is that, 750? You know, that's not going to happen. So really what happened was that the legitimate market wasn't followed in the illegitimate market. Changes that took place in the legitimate markets where prices largely increased to allow for the euro in the, in the, in the illegitimate market, there was no real change. It was just rounded figures was all that was important. And, and systemic crime is crimes committed as a consequence of the fact that drugs are illegal and there is an illicit market. And we refer to these as systemic types of crime. How we understand this, we look at things like drug seizures, drug prices, drug purities, drug routes. Price and purity, if the purity of drugs is, is lower, will the price be lower? And in any studies sort of I've conducted here anyway, and there are very few, um, there doesn't seem to be a huge connection between price and purity, certainly not at a street level. If somebody keeps giving somebody crap, as it's referred to, they will simply go to a different dealer. But it doesn't seem to be reflected in changes uh, in price. But you would assume also, let's say, for example, if there's a lower, lower availability, you would assume that um, prices would increase following basic demand supply. And yet what we have seen is that Drug prices have decreased in Ireland over the last uh, number of years, while availability hasn't really been uh, affected. So these are the sorts of indicators we try and use to understand uh, the market. We have seen a sort of a stabilisation of markets over time. Um, and often we look at drug markets as, um, as a sort of a, in a simple way of explaining, as involving three levels. You have the import level, you have what we refer to as the middle market level and then you have the street level and then you have what are referred to at street level as open and closed markets so an open market might be a market on the street where you can go up and you can be a complete stranger um, and they will sell you drugs and there was a time in Dublin particularly when all those street protests and marches were taking place when you did have a lot of that uh, around, the, around the city it still exists um, but it's, it's less open in the sense that um, often you have to know the person that you're getting uh, drugs off. So we use the concept of open and closed markets to describe this type of, uh, type of thing. You might have closed markets in that they take place in clubs, in nightclubs. And again, you would have to know the person or be introduced to the person by somebody who is trusted before you will get, uh, get drugs. And also, one of the reasons that forces markets from open to closed is because of police undercover operations. And which are a major uh, uh, factor of policing in the illicit drug, uh, drug trade, and um, where they pose as, as drug users or people looking for drugs, and as a consequence, people are increasingly cautious about who they, are, who they are buying and selling from. Local drug markets are particularly important, of course, particularly open ones, because they cause huge community disturbance. People see them all the time. People who are trying to get, get treatment have to go, want, run through a gauntlet of drug dealers, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. Also, for younger people, they might be attracted to the, the money that has been made, particularly in very social and economically deprived 
communities. So open drug markets are attractive to young people and they are problematic from that perspective uh, as well because they are seen as legitimate. If they are happening openly, without interference, well, then there must be something okay uh, about them. So they are particularly important. In terms of the involvement of organised crime, and organised crime is a term that I think requires a lot of like, analysis because two people, and recently we've had legislation on organised crime, but, but two or three people can be organised. Um, they can arrange something together. But does that mean they can be referred to as organised crime? Yes, it does, in one way. But is that what we understand by organised crime? Um, and that's, this is something, a study that I'm completing at the moment is the first national study on, on uh, illicit drug markets, which has taken place in four locations around the country where I've, I've tried to address those types of questions. How are drug markets structured? Who was involved? What sort of roles do they perform? Um, and these types uh, of questions. Because in a way you have to look at it like an ordinary market, like a legitimate market. Because there are, there, are, there are massive profits to be made, but there are exchanges, there, are, uh, um, uh, there is supply, there is demand, etc., and, uh, and these are important. So how organised is organised crime? Europol has, do, has looked at sort of compared different types of markets, and um, it says one of the unique things about the Irish market is that it is, involves families, that <coughs> at a certain higher level it is very much centred around families uh, in a lot of other countries, of course, it would be centred around uh, perhaps particular ethnic groups. Now, one study I conducted here um, in Dublin was on crack cocaine. There's a copy of that at the back. And that found that crack cocaine initially, in around 2005, was associated with, uh, with West Africans, initially. Um, and or else people coming back from England who had the ability to wash up cocaine into, uh, into crack. And so that was an interesting factor in that it was something that was associated with a new ethnic, uh, a new ethnic group emerging here who had the know-how, who had the ability. But that is no longer the case now um, uh, uh, throughout, throughout, throughout the city. Um, and then there's the final model. This is the, called the common cause model, where drug use, illicit drug use, and offending behaviour are common factors um, of perhaps a deviant lifestyle. One doesn't necessarily lead to the other. Um, but they are both factors of other things, are consequences of other things. They're not causally linked, but they're produced by underlying social factors, such as inequality, deprivation, etc. And just to go through this list, studies that have been conducted here since the 1990s, since Paul O'Mahony conducted a major study, and he's speaking here, I think, in a couple of weeks, on a sociological and criminological profile of Mountjoy prisoners. And uh, he went through, and, and this nothing has emerged to say that this profile is any different uh, today. That the most were single male aged 14 to 30. They were urban, living in the parental home from large and often broken families. They left school before the minimum age of 16. They were from areas with high levels of unemployment, their best ever job in the lowest socioeconomic class. They had a high number of previous convictions and rates of recidivism uh, where they'd been to prison before. They had a history of family members being in prison and they were from local authority housing and areas of high levels of long-term unemployment. Now, the common cause model is probably the most under-investigated model, but it is also probably the most important. But from a policymaker's perspective, it is a much more difficult model to, ch to, to handle because the common cause model says that a drug policy on its own is not going to solve the drug problem or the drugs and crime problem unless you look at all of the social and economic context in which drug use and crime take place you can't fix the problem um, and so it's a much more challenging uh, reality from a policy making perspective Sorry, if that is the case and you clearly have this well researched are you uh, successful governments that you've that the Health Bread Research Board has been informing are, are they taking any of this kind of research on board? Well, they are. I mean, like the National Drug Strategy combines a number of, it combines five pillars, including demand reduction, uh, supply reduction, uh, treatment, education, and rehabilitation, and research. So, so in a sense, the model is, is right, it's, and it's quite a, it's quite a well-respected approach. Um, so it, it, it is acknowledging those multiple dimensions. Now, if you're talking specifically about crime, however, um, and the causes and the solutions to crime, they cannot only be 
policing solutions or imprisonment, etc. Certainly not that. Um, they must be responded to in a more holistic, uh, holistic way. So I think that is... I don't think that anybody who doesn't realise that is the case. But translating it into actual policy is much more challenging because there is no quick fix solution to that. Yeah, it's long term. It's a long term societal change. It's not just about introducing the policy with 50 action points. It's a much broader societal change that you have to address. For example, if you look at the initiative that was taken in Limerick, um, that was a multifaceted approach to that problem involving changing infrastructure, looking at education looking at um, preschool, looking at family support, looking at, and that is the way you address not only the drug problem, but the crime problem. And that's the, that's the important thing that this, the common cause type of research has shown. So just to summarise the link between drugs and crime, most drug users do not commit crimes other than those of possession. There's a link between some forms of illicit drug use and crime, and particularly violent crime, mostly some forms of illicit drug use and crime, mostly heroin and, and cocaine. Most problematic users receive prison sentences for drug-related offences rather than drug offences. Just to point, explain what I mean by that. Um, there's a major crisis of overcrowding in our prisons, and increasingly this is getting some attention. Um, and, and a lot of international organisations, recently the Committee for the Prevention of Torture, has focused on this major issue, and the inspector of prisons has written a lot about the, the, this very serious crisis within, within the prison system. Most of those who are dependent drug users receive very short sentences of between three to six months in prison. So they're obviously not seen as a threat to society if they're only serving such short sentences. And clearly, given the state of the prisons, although the treatment in prisons uh, has improved a lot in the last, uh, since about 2006, um, clearly that is not the answer to somebody who is a dependent, problematic, addicted uh, person. Um, now legislation is to be introduced to, um, to basically force judges to consider non-custodial sentences for anybody who they would have given a one-year sentence. And that has to be most dependent drug users. Um, and that is a question, again, that for society, um, that we have to look at different ways of, of, of treating people uh, who are dependent users. And a very highly stigmatised group of people as well, people with serious health problems. This is a very important finding. Most problematic users began their criminal career before their drug use. So it wasn't drugs that led them to commit crime. They were already committing crimes. So drugs didn't cause crime. Their offending behaviour had already begun. Now drug use and particularly addiction would have increased <coughs> the rate of their offending behaviour, but it didn't cause it in the first place. So if you're trying to address the cause, you have to address the cause of crime in, in, in the first place. So there's no clear causal link between drug use and crime. There is links proven between alcohol and violent crime, and, and that is clear in the evidence. Again, although there is so much concern about illicit drug use, although we read in our newspapers every day about some gangland killing, and there is a lot of public concern and public fear, and there's huge amounts of legislation out there to address it, we know very little about illicit drug markets in Ireland. We know almost nothing. Um, the research that, that, that has been done, the research I've done, say, on crack cocaine, was the first study that really tried to address this as a market and the dynamics of a market and tried to apply that sort of logic uh, to it. If you're trying to interfere or you're, or you're trying to intervene and address it, um, I think you have to start approaching it uh, in that way. What brings people into it? What sort of profits are being made? Um, and these types of questions. How is it structured? How many people uh, are involved? Um, and this is research that has been done. Early next year, there will be a study for, uh, that, that, uh, that is finished now, which is due to be published by the National Advisory Committee on Drugs and ourselves and the Health Research Board, which again looks at, this, uh, at drug markets from that perspective, looking at four markets around the country, um, um, uh, you know, one city, um, um, one suburban area, one inner city area, one uh, regional town, to try and get a sense of different types of markets and, and, and how they evolve, how they are organised and structured, and how we respond to them. And that's the other point. There's almost no research done on what the police are actually doing. We see, we see the statistics, the data, the graphs and the trends that I've shown, but we don't know how many people are stopped and searched. 
in, in, we don't know how the legislation has been implemented. How many people are stopped and searched and who are they? How many of them are arrested? Um, what happens with those people? How are people trying to get that information? I mean, I used to work as a journalist and hmm. I know it's extremely difficult to get information out of the guards. Has there been attempts to get that kind of information? Well, it, it's not so... I mean, the, the IT system in the guards has improved dramatically. In the, the Pulse system, police union leading systems effectively, it's called, that has improved dramatically, but it was never introduced for journalists and for researchers. It was introduced as, a, as an operational factor. Now, something that is improving is the connection between the different parts of the system. For example, the police, the, uh, the prosecutor's office, the, uh, the courts and the prisons. Because there's no connection in terms of trying to understand it from a research perspective or a journalistic perspective. You can't follow people through the system. You know, and, and that's something that we, have, that we have been very weak at. It's, it is to improve, and it is improving s slowly. But it doesn't... And also, let's say if you go deeper than that, um, like there's a huge amount of what we would refer to as captured data. Um, for example, th those being prosecuted. You know, the, the sort of the st research that I'm interested in, and, and the guards worked very closely with this research project. Um, you know, in a, in a huge way, uh, they, they have cooperated with it. So I think it is not only about that resistance, because it's not their... Like, this is something now that the, that it's not only an Irish thing. This is something that the European Commission, Europol, and an organization called the European Monitoring Centre on Drugs and Drug Addiction in Lisbon are now collaborating on developing indicators to understand the connections between drugs and crime and supply reduction efforts. Um, and that is, that is only now really developing. And, th and that's the other point. We don't know how many people are committing offences as a consequence of a drug addiction. We don't know that, that what we refer to as the attributable cause of the offence. So, um, you know, in prison they are drug offenders. But most of them, as I said, are in there because of an addiction and a, a crime committed as a consequence of that addiction. But we don't know how many. We know the numbers using methadone within the prison system. So clearly they are people who have very serious uh, drug problems. But in terms of understanding crime and uh, offending and criminal justice responses to it, our understanding is very limited. And from a democratic or accountable perspective, huge resources go into this area and have always gone into the area. There's almost never been any sort of cutback on, on spending on law and order. But there's very little understanding of how that money is actually spent in, in practice. So there is that, is that is a very important issue. But you're saying there isn't a cultural... Um, my Dealing with the guard, there was a cultural issue about giving information. The guards are very close, and compared to many other societies, yeah. I include military mm. dictatorships, yeah. very secretive. Yeah. So you're saying that the lack of information, from your point of view, is not a cultural issue. I didn't say that, but um, the, the culture, there is, of course, a cultural issue, in, and, and uh, policing studies have shown there's a very inherent conservatism and a great wariness of potential criticism, etc. Now, what we've had here up until very recently, up until the, about the mid-2000s, was that the guards would never give any information on, say, things like seizures, drug seizures, or things like that in the local area, until the Garda Commissioner's report was published. Now, the Garda Commissioner's report was usually about two years out of date. So it was of no use in terms of understanding what was going on locally. I was involved in setting up a community policing system in the north inner city in 2000 with the, the late Tony Gregory and local guards in Store Street, and it's still functioning very effectively. But it was, I think, January 2000 when a member of the local guard at Drugs Unit stood up and he explained to the local people, about 300 local people, the number of seizures that had been made in the last three months in the area. Now, I was flabbergasted at the time because that was something that had never been done before. Where you, now... It didn't tell them a huge amount that they didn't know anyway, because they lived there. But I think what the Gardaí didn't realise was the, the importance, in terms of communicating to people, of just sh showing them that you're actually doing something, rather than just saying it, but showing that you... And it is, a, it is a form of accountability. I think what you could probably say is that, that there's... And this isn't only just institutions like the Gardaí. There has never really been accountability in that sense here in any of the institutions that have sort of formed 
the sort of identity of the state. And that is something that I think is now breaking down. Clearly it is breaking, and people are demanding it. Um, but I think that probably is part of, of, of the picture. Now, in terms of our debates about drug-related crime and drug crime and all of these various things, I think one thing that has often been missing is a perspective on those who are most affected by drug-related crime. The drug problem has always disproportionately impacted on the most vulnerable communities in the sense that they are already <coughs> suffering numerous uh, aspects of socio and economic problems, low education levels, early school leaving, um, high levels of unemployment, etc. And they are also the greatest victims in terms of, of drug offending. Um, there isn't this romantic idea that people in certain areas go out to other areas and, and rob from other areas. That is, and that is one of the things, I think, that really led to the huge marches that emerged in uh, inner city Dublin in the 1980s and the 1990s, was that heroin changed the complexion of crime in a lot of these areas because people were now robbing on their own people, whereas traditionally there had been a sense of, well, you don't rob on your own. But the drug problem completely undermined that whole romantic uh, notion. And I think that is, a, that is a perspective that responses have to look at. For example, one of the major issues at the moment, I believe, is, um, and this was sort of a picture of how communities responded at that time, you know, having marches, marching in government buildings, setting up vigils out in the street to stop people uh, dealing, marching on people's houses who they alleged were drug dealers and evicting them from their houses, and on one occasion uh, killing somebody who was uh, uh, um, uh, an alleged uh, dealer. And that's the whole aspect of, of vigilantism as well. There is that potential. But what it did show was a serious crisis where a lot of communities felt we're not noticed and our problems are not addressed. And I think there is a sense that their problems, that as the, as the saying goes, they were over-policed, but they were under-protected, in that their priorities, their crime priorities, were not really being reflected in what was happening and um, what the criminal justice system uh, was doing. After Veronica Guerin, the state response was to, you know, symbolically assert itself that we are winning the war on drugs, Criminal Assets Bureau was something that was quite original and was something that has been followed up in many other countries. And a range of new drug laws uh, were, in, in, were introduced in the wake of that uh, of Veronica Kieran's killing. But again, communities were asking, when you actually look at the legislation in practice, are our priorities actually being reflected in the policing process? And the policing initiative I mentioned there earlier in the, early in the um, 2000 was the first time that you really had a sort of form of local democratic accountability in Store Street, which is still going on. Subsequently now, since 2005, there's been the Garda Act. This is a quite ambitious <coughs> poster of the Labour Party in um, 1997, or 19, yeah, 1997 elections, um, 1992 drug barons reign, 1997 drug barons run. Now, there's a number of reasons why they might have run. One reason is that the source of drugs are not in Ireland. They are in, often in Spain, or they're in uh, Portugal, um, or in, they're in the Netherlands. So there's, there's, a, sort of an, there's a logical reason uh, to move. And now recently, I believe, as a, as a consequence of the organised crime legislation, that is something that seems to be causing some concern. And also the, the ability to use different forms of evidence, particularly commun uh, you know, um, uh, photographic evidence, and telecommunication evidence in prosecutions is something that is apparently uh, causing some concern. But drug markets have changed as well. They've become more hidden, and as I said, the mobile phone has facilitated this. They've become more credit-based, where people are giving drugs on tick or on, or on credit, more mobile, but they've become more violent, and a lot of research has shown that, and they've become much younger, and much younger people being involved, and much younger people being brought in as to keep a lookout, to hold on to drugs, to, um, uh, to run drugs between various people, but being brought into the enterprise at a much younger age. And some say that is one of the reasons that has also become more violent, uh, and, and where people, to get debts of very small amounts of money, are prepared to use levels of violence that historically, uh, only 10 years ago, they, you wouldn't have seen uh, in the Irish drug scene. And some of the issues that are there, of course, um, 
that need to be addressed. One of the major issues, I think, that hasn't really um, uh, sort of got national headlines as of yet, I think, is the issue of intimidation and violence. Drug-related intimidation of not just users, but their families um, in response to drug debts. And economically, as, as, you know, as the market decreases, people's determination to recoup their debts becomes much more heightened. And there has been some studies done by the Family Support Network and by Citywide Drugs Crisis Campaign, which has been trying to put some sort of focus onto this, uh, this really serious uh, issue. But again, I think the fact that it isn't really in the mainstream yet shows you the way in which the, crime, the drug-related crime problem is, is how it's prioritised. This, I think, is the main priority for a lot of communities around the city, addressing the issue of intimidation. But it's not really, you know, on the national thing. There's an article at the back I wrote there in our journal, Drugnet Ireland, uh, which you can get your hands on, where there is, uh, I've written up a, a recent conference which looked specifically at this issue of intimidation. No-go areas, community stigma, the development of gangs, particularly the involvement of young people and the emergence of sort of, sort of gangs around drugs, Fear of reprisal, which is a major issue in terms of the state and the, and the drug strategy is based, a lot of it is based on local drug task forces and re requiring people in local communities to work with the organs of the state to address the various problems. But fear of reprisal and the fear of seen to be associated with responses of the state breaks down that, that cooperation or that willingness to cooperate, to cooperate. And there's a major democratic uh, problem in relation to that. So in terms of things like intimidation and drug-related crime and fear, there is a serious requirement of the state to, if it wants to sustain some sort of policy response, it has to address issues of intimidation. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move on um, and conclude. I think one of the things we have to question in terms of responses is on whose response is the behalf being made and how do we prioritise this issue? First looking at it, analysing it and then prioritising. What is the important thing to, to start with? Because you do have to prioritise. You, you can get a copy of this presentation. I just want to just finish with this slide. Some of the debates, of course, uh, doing the rounds, of course, are like legalisation of drugs and some argue well, that will take the market uh, from underneath the gangs and the dealers. Decriminalisation where you, um, uh, you, you, you introduce different sanctions. Portugal is the first country, uh, in, certainly in Europe, if not in the world, to decriminalise all drugs. And so people are now sent to a, so a form of sort of committee that deals with issues of treatment, etc. But they are taken completely out of the criminal justice uh, system. Um, Depenalisation, where you don't send people to prison if they have a health problem. That's, that's what you address. You don't incarcerate them as a consequence. The Dutch solution, which has virtually legalised the consumption of drugs in regulated conditions in what they called coffee houses, but a very interesting situation or solution in that in, in, in the Netherlands, the front door is legal, but the back door is illegal, as they say. The supply of drugs to the coffee house is, remains illegal, but the consumption of drugs in the coffee house is legal. So this is a sort of a form of, you know, and then, you know, you've things like community-based mediation, problem-solving, local community policing, uh, etc. I'm going to finish on that. So feel free to question or comment, whatever, yeah? What, what's the uh, data from the Portuguese solution and the Dutch solution? Is it helping? Yes, I think the data is generally fairly positive. A couple, there's a few articles that have been written about that. Um, they say the Portuguese situation first in that... Um, there has been no increase in drug use is one thing. There has been no increase in drug-related deaths, which is a very important indicator. And the Netherlands has shown a consistent decrease in drug-related deaths. Because what, what, the, what the Dutch were doing, and this was as early as 1966, was it wasn't about legalising drugs. That wasn't their interest. Their interest was about separating markets. So separating the cannabis market from more serious drug markets. And that is something that they, they have succeeded in doing. Now, they're under a lot of pressure. One of the problems at the moment is because of the h much higher purity of, of cannabis, um, and uh, in the Netherlands in particular. And that's a concern that a lot of other countries would have. Um, a problem for the Dutch, of course, is they've come under huge pressure from other European countries to reverse their approach. And 
they seem to be yielding to that pressure um, and some internal pressure as well. There is some political division. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's no political party in the Netherlands that wants to reverse that general approach. But what they're talking about doing is making them only accessible to Dutch people, for example, so that they're not a tourist attraction uh, for, for non-Dutch people. So those are the sort of issues. The Portuguese process, I've read a you know everything that's been written about that and that also seems to be a very and I've seen them actually working and uh, it seems to be a really interesting uh, uh, process now one of the problems associated with this and it's like it's about 10 years now in operation is the, is the, is the, the message it gives out to young people and this is often a very difficult thing to, to address does that mean drugs are okay and that is something that they're sort of looking at at the moment how, how and it's a very difficult one to to square how do you actually because you don't know what message you're, the 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 more deterrent or prohibitive approach is giving what message is that giving but the more liberal approach that is also giving a message that needs to be considered and i think also the the coffee shop phenomenon is a very interesting <laughs> that i think has that challenges anybody who calls for a liberalization of drug laws because what, one of the concerns about that here was that a lot of people could avail of, of drugs in these coffee shops that mirrored, for example, cocaine, methadone. But many people started using mind-altering substances who would never have done otherwise, except alcohol and tobacco, well, alcohol. So they would never have experimented with substances like that. But the fact that you could go into the city centre and go into you know, a main street and go in and buy your drugs and go into the nightclub next door, it, it did give a message to people that that's, that's okay. And that was a major issue. Now they've been pretty much all closed down. But I think anyone, anyone in a free market economy who argues for legalization must also confront the fact that people will then sell aggressively. They will sell aggressively. Look at alcohol, um, you know, alcohol pops, you know, People are making profit, and there's huge amounts of profit to be made. Of course, there's massive profits in an illicit market, but there's also massive profits in an illicit market. Like, one of the things about the head shop phenomenon was the amount of money that were seized. Um, like, for example, there was one burnt out in Cable Street, and they seized, uh, you know, I think it was half a million um, from that shop. And if you observe them, that there was a huge trade. So there's a lot of money to be made. And this is a free market economy, so, and there will be aggressive advertising. And so people who argue for a more liberal approach have to look at that. Now, that is not to say that those arguments aren't valid, but people are, come often from a harm reduction approach, and they're saying that the current system isn't working because people are generally ignoring it, and, and so the harms are hit, and the harms of their use is hidden. So we have to try and bring it more out to the open so we can address these harms. Another argument about the coffee shops was that once you made them illegal, all the substances would simply be transferred into the illicit market. I don't think that has really happened. Methadrone, I'd say it's, it is very likely it has happened. But a lot of other substances seem to disappear. And then, of course, there's the reality that people are getting drugs over the Internet. So how do you challenge that? How do you legislate for the Internet? No. Yeah. Sorry. Ah, Rory here. Just around um, your the thing around you know, the inelasticity of heroin in particular, and it, it's kind of counterintuitive to think that it would be elastic because it's like the archetype of drug of addiction and mm. people are very dependent on it, but interestingly, about this time last year or a little bit later, there was a good six month drought of, of the availability of street heroin, and it just became unavailable really, and that threw up its own consequences, like people getting ripped off buying stuff that just wasn't heroin, and whatever heroin was around became very, very pricey. Mm. But one of the things I would have expected, and you heard anecdotal evidence of it happening, but it didn't come across in the statistics, that people hammered um, treatment centres then, that people that would have been addicted to street heroin then all of a sudden would have gone to their local treatment centre. The, the statistics at the treatment centres didn't reflect that. Mm. So and they were going there for, for, for methadone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I don't know what, what that was about. Maybe some of it is to do with some heroin use being discretionary. Mm. Maybe people using heroin on top of a normal, on top of their methadone maintenance and using heroin on dull day or yeah, yeah. had a few, few 
two bob extra. You know? Yeah. And then that expression we use went out. Mm. They might have diverted into other drugs, you know, yeah. maybe like benzodiazepines and things like that. That's what I was just thinking. That is probably, I would say, I mean, that drought they say was because of a drought in Afghanistan. Yeah. The crop being affected in Afghanistan, how that then rebounded here. But that, um, I would say, it is the polydrug issue that is very. It was a study done in the south inner city called a dizzying array of substances, which showed how in a very small and often people there's a perception sometimes that you've got a heroin mark and you've got a cannabis mark and you've got an, and never the twain shall meet. But um, I think you know yourself better than I do that that's that's not the case. And so it is probable that people were moving, maybe for a similar hit um, or something something similar. But it, it's an interesting like factor. Did that increase the number of people seeking methadone? People who were who were happy to use heroin and didn't want weren't interested in me- methadone. You would imagine there would have been a spike. Yeah. You know, and there wasn't in the, in the mm. statistics. Have they been? Have they, those statistics been published yet? Have they? Yeah, they have. Before, okay. Before that time period, okay. Yeah. Mm. It'd be well, very interesting to check it out. John, yeah. hey. You mentioned about the drugs task force earlier. Mm. Um, I know a lot of the funding was cut very recently, and most of their funding, I think, has been cut most of the organisations. <coughs> and I wonder if any statistics or data out there yet about the impact that's having on communities. Um, well, you see, that, uh, there's a guy, um, is it Harvey? I know his second name is Harvey, um, who's written a lot on this, on the actual, the social, the social infrastructure of communities, or the social capital, as Putnam would put it, and how those task forces and all of the voluntary work around those task forces is so important for those communities. And so that tiny amount of money that they've cut back the effect that has. It has a multiple corrosive uh, impact. Now, he's the only one I'm aware of who's really written about that uh, so far. And, you know, but I, I, in, in terms of other, like, data, has that, I, I don't know, you'd ha- I think that would require that type of soci- sociological analysis that he, that, that he applies. Um, and the thing is that it, it's probably the most well-spent money is money spent at that local level. In your recent Mr. Are your recent receptors for much evidence of crystal meth use? No, there was a bit. There was a lot of fear of crystal meth, um, and, and crystal meth was something like in a European context. It was the main area is the or main country is the Czech Republic, um, and I think Norway or Sweden were sort of standout countries in terms of crystal meth. Um, the UK has had a big problem with it as well, but there was a concern about two years ago that because it was sort of emerging in the UK that the guards felt there's an 18-month transfer period. But um, UK have had crystal meth problems since the 80s, and it's never really taken off as a big problem here. Now, there have been a number of seizures, but it hasn't seemed to have taken off. And any research I've done, um, it's been talked about and mentioned, but nothing like, say, crack cocaine has been mentioned. And there we've seen, since it emerged really in 2005, it is now available, certainly in... All, all task force areas around Dublin, and it is a it is a it is a market that is a very stable market and a very lucrative market. Like while prices have fluctuated in other drugs, um, um, crack is something that has been very steady and very lucrative uh, because people are you know there's such a demand for it, such a repeat demand. But in terms of crystal meth, you know, and it's also probably it's probably more concealed, you know, if you can call it a market because people can can produce it in their home. Like I remember watching a video once where the, the only way police seized crystal meth was when houses blew up because of the mixture of, of, of chemicals. So, um, and so it might be something that is, that is concealed possibly within certain ethnic groups who have, it, uh, who have a cultural background of using crystal meth. But I don't think it has, it has transferred across to mainstream Irish society. Yes, I, I was just wondering if it's the same you were talking about just now. Um, I've read in the media about this new phenomenon in the UK that they label it as bath substance, but um, bath salts. Yeah, yeah. It, has that reached Ireland already? Because it's a very strong sub- substance. It's been in, yeah, it's been and gone. And that like a, the substances in what were fo- referred to as head shops were nearly always marketed as something else, like bath salts and and, and things like that. So that was. That's how the head shops were sort of getting around it. Now the new legislation that was passed in 2010, um, pro- you know, prohibits that. 
So now most head shops and things, about 10 of them out of whatever there was, 80 or 90 or more, are, are remaining open. And that's largely because of that new legislation that was introduced, the Psychotropic Substances Act of mm -hmm. 2010. I'll just take one final quick one there. Just, just very quickly, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Optimistic. <laughs> I think one issue that I think uh, that I've mentioned that I think is really a, an important one is the issue of intimidation because that is really breaking down families in ways that mainstream society and the government doesn't seem to really appreciate yet and uh, and I think there really needs to be a concerted response to that because once that once that is allowed and particularly if the whole concept of gangs and territorial control is allowed to develop well, then it'll, it'll turn a corner and it will really be very difficult to re come back. I mean, there was a study done recently in Limerick called Understanding Limerick, and it showed the way in certain parts of Limerick that it was a very organised destruction of a community to facilitate drug dealing. And there was a very conscient, a sort of conscious disintegration of, of, of areas and co to assert control by people involved in the drugs trade. And I think if that's not grasped, you know, if we have a sort of, a, I think we have, we can see what can, what can happen. And if that isn't grasped, and I think that the, the, the issue of intimidation is something that really has the potential to, to, you know, to where you have people coming together in the past in large groups and sitting in meeting rooms like the photographs I've shown you, that's, it's very difficult to get that because people are so fearful. But I think it, without that, without that willingness of people to come together and to address it, um, the state can't address it on its own. Certainly can't. So, so that would that would be, I'd be, I'd be, I wouldn't be optimistic unless that is addressed. So, just like to say thank you very much for coming along, and thank you very much for joining us. Very welcome.